Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last in our series on artists in London. Um, today we come on to two topics which highlight both key words in the title. Artists, because we're getting on to the Impressionists, and London, because we're getting into fog, something which seems quite appropriate after the vote last week, <laughs> as I pointed out in the Daily Telegraph on Saturday. Now, Impressionism has quite long roots. Um, as were the observations by artists that the increasing industrialisation of London, even in the middle 18th century, as we heard last week, um, started having an effect on um, light and uh, the um, skyscape of, uh, of London. Um, ironically, of course, British artists tended to go to the Mediterranean for the blue skies, and Monet's work initially sold better abroad than it did in London. There was also perhaps an additional technical factor because ready-made paint was available in tubes um, in the course of the 19th century. And so you start getting colours like cobalt, ultramarine, cerulean and cadmium yellow. Previously, people had to make up their own paints. You might also like to look up the lectures given by our very own emeritus professor of physics, Will Aleph, who studied the impact of declining eyesight on some of our better-known artists, such as Turner. Now, with regard to fog, I dare say that quite a lot of people in the audience with very small children can just remember a genuine London pea super. Um, I do recall that sour smell of London coming up from the Kent coast, um, coming across Blackheath and going down into Lewisham. You might remember there was an enormous advert with a pirate with one leg and it said, more hops in Ben Truman. And I never used to ask my dad, are we there yet? Because <laughs> once I saw more hops in Ben Truman, I knew we were nearly at grandma's. And my grandma, unfortunately, actually died as a result of the last smog. Anyway, fog is something that has almost defined London in some people's minds between the novels of Charles Dickens, the adventures of Sherlock Holmes and the sinister films of Alfred Hitchcock. Now, Dr Christine Corton is a senior member of Wolfson College, Cambridge. She's the author of what is effectively a biography of London fog, so she's very well placed to look at its impact on the world of art and the Impressionists. Christine. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm not sure I've got a lot left to say now. Tim seems to have uh, captured it quite well through this murky vision. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Gresham College for inviting me, um, and especially Dr Valerie Shrimpling and her team uh, for helping organising it, and also to, obviously, Tim for introducing me and organising these one o'clock lectures. I think, first of all, for those of us who don't remember London Fog, I should really kind of describe the kind of conditions that I'm talking about. This is actually a picture from 1827, London Particular. Um, London Particular was actually a fond, affectionate name given to London Fog. Um, it wasn't coined by Dickens, as many people think. Um, Basically, it was also the name of um, a Madeira wine that was specially ex imported to London. So I think it highlights the very special relationship that London Fog has to London. Of course, other industrial cities did have their own smoke problems, but no one really owned it like London. Londoners were secretly proud of it, so they gave, them, um, uh, they gave Fogs these very special names, London particular, London Ivy, Pea Super, Carl, Carlisle called it Black Broth. Interestingly, a lot of these uh, names are actually to do with food. So, um, sorry, I realised I haven't timed myself. Um, so they were to do with food, ingesting food, and Bob Hope quipped at um, uh, one point when he came over to do, do a talk and got caught in a London fog. He said, well, Californian smog is London fog with the vitamins removed. So, um, <laughs> um, and then finally we come along to the more modern term smog, which was actually coined in 1904, 1905 by a chemist who wanted to get rid of these very affectionate names. He said, let's get rid of this London particular, London ivy. You know, let's call it what it is, a kind of mixture of smoke fog. Interestingly, it never really took off. People kind of resented it having this quite short, cold name. And in fact, smog is now more kind of um, connected to the kind of haze we get from car exhaust fumes, the kind of smog that Californians know so well. So here we've got this 1827 print, um, and you can see the kind of conditions that we're talking about. 
very, very black in the uh, uh, background. People panicking, there's a link lighter there to help light their way. And this poor chap dressed like a dandy with a, a yellow handkerchief covering his mouth indicating disease um, is about to be knocked over by these horses. Um, lots of accidents in the fog. Um, George Cruikshank, 1819. There we have, again, a lot of confusion. We have so, some poor lady about to be um, kind of having her neck crushed by this man's leg. Uh, lots of link lighters. Again, this is a theme that runs through a lot of these um, prints and early paintings of London in the fog. Um, link lighters meant to lead your way to safety, quite often associated with crime. If you were very unlucky, you would get um, a link lighter who would take you down a very dark alley and his um, companions would sandbag you, knock you out and take all your valuables. Um, there we have one link lighter who you know, seems to be about to singe that man's beard. Um, and generally mayhem, etc. Is that one actually te pinching something from his pocket? And uh, again, traditionally, the horses and carriages looming through. Another one from a later time, 1872. Again, link lighters adding more confusion than light. Um, an umbrella drop there. The horses again looming, looming through. And there's a pickpocket um, taking. Um, that poor man's um, watch. These, I think, are fog glasses. I'm not sure how seriously they were taken. Um, in fact, there's a punch cartoon which shows fog glasses for horses as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure they worked, but there were lots of kind of attempts to kind of reduce the impact of fog. Um, and actually, interestingly, even from the early 19th century, there were attempts to reduce the smoke in the air. Don't think that it's just a 20th century phenomenon that we dealt with this um, rather nasty um, air pollution problem. It killed animals, birds. This is a poor swan that would have been flying around above the fog, could not find anywhere to land, and would actually fall down um, uh, in uh, an exhausted state and be hit by a car. London Zoo reported that lots of animals, especially with white fur, white feathers, would actually constantly try to clean uh, their, their plumage and would actually ingest the very large particulates from the, small, um, from the coal fires um, and would therefore have a very shortened life and would quite often actually suffocate from those particulates. Unfortunately, because London fog always kind of, it was very common during the winter months, quite often the Smithfield Cattle Show would actually coincide with... Um, um, a foggy outbreak. So there's one particularly bad one in 1873 when probably about 80 um, heads of cattle had to be put down or died from suffocation. And when post-mortems were done on their, their um, lungs, they would be filled with this black bile. They literally couldn't breathe. Um, so people with vulnerable lung conditions, the elderly, the very young, um, would actually um, suffer. Joseph Haydn said in 1791, there was fog so thick that one might have spread it on bread. Um, he, in 18, um, 1891, the novelist George Gissing also noticed the effect of fog on mental well-being, referring to a thick black fog which penetrated every corner of the house. It could be smelt and tasted. Such an atmosphere produces low-spirited languor, even in the vigorous and hopeful. To those wasted by suffering, it is the very reek of the bottomless pit, poisoning the soul. And of course, the point was that fog was quite often very bad in the poorer areas. Just as now in the 21st century, we now have schools in um, very poor um, built-up areas in the East End, um, which are next to major roads and therefore suffering from the pollution of the cars, very much the East End was a major sufferer of the fog. And I think as it moved westwards, that's when politicians started to take it very seriously. Um, Affected sport. Um, this is actually a particularly famous football match between Moscow Dynamos and Arsenal in 1940. 
1945, post-war, uh, the Russian team had specifically asked to um, actually have um, a match against Arsenal. That was the only reason they wanted to come. As you can see, it happened on a particularly foggy day. The referee had been chosen by the Russians um, and he refused to cancel the um, match. Um, and it was rumoured um, that the Russians actually had 12 people on the pitch. <laughs> um, they won 3-2. And actually, if you want to, there is um, a YouTube um, uh, uh, thing that you can kind of look up where they actually show the match. And you can see how thick it was. You could not see your hand in front of your face. You couldn't see your feet um, below. I mean, literally, um, there were lots of accidents. You, as, I, as I showed in the earlier pictures, you could fall, fall in front of horses and carriages, in front of cars, and worse than that, you might fall into the river, which, you know, not till later in the 19th century were there actually um, any kind of barricades. So uh, there's a story in my book about three or four youths who've just been paid, they're play, uh, paid from their, their salary, and they're just playing leapfrog in the fog, and two of them leapfrog in the Thames, and um, they drown. Um, just to kind of bring it up slightly to the more modern era, um, Morton, Henry Vollum Morton, a journalist in his book In Search of London, um, recalled in 1951 being caught in a thick pea soup which tastes like iron filings at the back of your throat, turning every lamp into a downward V of haze. It gave to every encounter a nightmare quality, almost of terror, of one of the most exciting acts of God. So it's also linked to the sublime, this idea that it's dangerous, um, but it's also very exciting. And we move on to 1962. This is a picture of a policeman in a smog mask. They weren't really very effective, but it was seen as a palliative by the Macmillan government, who increasingly, after the 1952 smog, um, uh, were under pressure to introduce decent legislation to stop now, at this point, coal fires pr from producing um, uh, smoke. Um, in industries had had to clean up their acts earlier in the century, although in the 19th century there was very much a battle between industry and the domestic chimney. Indus industrialists said, why should we clean up our act when you've got all these domestic chimneys puffing out their, their, their smoke? Um, and of course Dickens, dear old Dickens, was slightly um, uh, both the hero and the villain of smoke um, legislation because he did write um, about how bad it was and how something had to be done, but he also um, made the hearth a kind of central family um, cornerstone in the home, and that made it kind of, um, po politicians very reluctant to deal with it. Um, so 1962 was the last smog we really experienced in this country. It's probably the one that many, some of you remember. Um, and this was purely because once the Clean Air Act had been passed in 1956, we had to wait a few years for hearths to be converted to um, use smokeless fuel and for stocks of smokeless fuel to be built up. So it wasn't an immediate thing. Um, as I say, Lots of deaths. I mean, the 1952 smog, probably at the time, they said it killed about 4,000 people. It's now reckoned probably about 12,000 people died in the 52 smog. Um, it was a major killer. And, of course, it didn't kill everyone immediately. That was the problem. They might die three months down the road um, with a bad cough, with emphysema, with kind of breathing difficulties. So, again, it's another problem of trying to pass this legislation. But let's come on to how artists dealt with it. Um, and in fact, the art critic and historian John Ruskin observed in his old age that had the weather, when I was young, been such as it is now, no books such as modern painters ever would or could have been written. London fog, he noticed, where the air is pure, though you choose to mix up dirt with it and choke yourself with your own nastiness. Many English artists, especially those based in London, felt the same about the murky atmosphere as Ruskin did. David Roberts, a fellow of the Royal Academy, acknowledged the problem in 1862. I break new ground with my London from the Thames, 
but I, sti but I have still two weeks, and if the weather keeps from fog, fog, I shall be all right and ready. Luke Fields, another ac academician who painted such well-known titles as the doctor, registered his unhappiness with the atmosphere in the strongest terms in October 1880. We have endured and still endure the most awfully dark and hopeless winter that has ever been known in London, consequently the civilised globe. We had uninterrupted heavy fog for five consecutive days last week. It is too dark for painting and so dense that we have had to burn gas to get our meals by. Nobody is doing any work except a few at Hampstead. And of course, Hampstead was on a hill, so um, actually had cleaner air. In fact, John Constable took his wife to live in Hampstead because she had breathing difficulties in London. For a painter who was literally scraping a living from his work, the lack of clear light and the need to spend money burning gas or candles during the day was catastrophic. Wealthier artists tried to circumvent the problem by having winter studios built, which were equipped with floor-to-ceiling windows, but even this did not help. Most simply went to the south of France or even the Holy Land during the winter months. Frederick Leighton, um, and there's a slide just showing him and the kind of art he was producing, was one of the most popular of all Victorian painters and a president of the Royal Academy. He felt so incensed about the fog problem that he used his position in the public eye to make a speech on the subject of London fog at the Lord Mayor's dinner in 1882. We are further and especially attacked and paralysed in the heart and centre of our intellectual activity. For we live by the suggestive imitation and presentment of that which is revealed to us by light and by light alone, and made lovely by its splendour. To us, therefore, the quenching of light, the blotting out of colour, is an approach to the drying up of the very life springs from which we are fed and set in motion. Many a brother painter must regret with me the interminable hours days and weeks of enforced idleness spent in the continuous contemplation of the ubiquitous yellow fog, depressing the spirits all the more. As regards colour and light, declared the Art Journal in 1888 in a discussion of painting in London, there is a standing grievance of the smoke. The blackness that comes from soot has neither depth nor luster. It is op opaque, gritty, shallow, Grey, a denial of everything that the colourist loves. Admittedly, then, London is not a good subject. The Royal Academy viewed history painting as the most important genre, creating dignity as well as showing patriotism. Often landscape art artists combined landscape with a historical scene, frequently harking back to the classical world to show an affinity with the achievements of Great Britain as a supreme power. As Nadell and Schwarzbach point out in their um, uh, um, writings on the Victorian city, traditional conventions and often outmoded ones were extremely powerful in all the arts in the century. And those that governed the graphic arts did not with ease admit urban subjects. Such subjects tended to be unruly, disordered, dirty and unpleasant. Mechanical achievements have been celebrated in art and seen as enhancing the landscape. Uh, views of Colebrookdale on the Severn were a rich source for many early 19th century artists, including Turner. But these paintings celebrated the energy of the blazing furnace, furnaces as sublime images, not the smoke that was produced as a side product before the fire really got going. The great engineers and industrial architects of the late 18th and early 19th centuries were esteemed not only as public benefactors, but also as true artists whose works enhanced the landscape. By the 1840s, however, the impact of industry on the landscape came to be seen in a more negative light. And as one commentator remarks, the alliance that had grown up in the later 18th century between science and art had a common foundation of humanism. When political economy abandoned the humanities standpoint for the defense of property, the link between science and art was broken. In addition, by this time, many buyers were prospering manufacturers, industrialists, part of the new upper middle class who preferred clear skies and clean lines. 
Turner, not surprisingly, painted one of the earliest pictures of London's fog in the 1835 painting The Thames Above Waterloo Bridge. Turner, as a true born Londoner, is advertising his familiarity with London's air problem by putting smoke and atmospheric pollution at its centre. And as you can see in here, the bridge is the central element, um, which is a theme that's later taken up by Monet. And it's, um, it's partly obscured by um, uh, the steam and smoke which rises from both sides of the river. Um, here we see a shot tower, I think you can just about see it, um, which was constructed in 1826. Um, do you know what shot towers are? They produce shot for um, uh, guns, ammunition, and they were very smoky, one of the more smoky in industries. Um, but it's barely visible, as you can see, um, um, as are the various industries on the Lambeth side of the river. Um, there's on this side, there's a, a steamship um, about to dock or preparing to leave. It's black smoke thrusting up to join the kind of swirling arc of smoke there. Um, William Rodner sees this painting as a potent essay on the energy and complexity of modern polluted urbanism. Smoke, I think, here represents a flourishing economy which brings employment and food on tables, but also the dirt and pollution associated with its fumes. All seems to be tainted by a sulphurous yellow. Even the black plumes of smoke from the two funnels of the steamer have yellow streaks in them to give them a greater sense of movement and vitality. The swirling, foggy vapours on both sides of the river do meet in an arc, um, uh, thus echoing the arches of the bridge as well as symbolising the connection between the city's technology of chimney stacks from factories and funnels of the steam steamboats and by implication the message that the smoke will not stay still but will move to connect itself over uh, the whole of the city. Um, Turner actually never bothered to finish this painting. Um, partly, I think, because he could see there was no ready market for it. Um, in spite of the fact that I think it's a rather beautiful painting. And also Canaletto, which I know you've heard about last week, still had a, a major influence with his um, clean lines and sun, sunlit skies. In fact, you know, there's barely a wisp. Uh, I mean, there's very, uh, some smoke there, but it's hardly obscuring the whole view. It's a much more ordered um, view of London. Um, the acceptable portrayal of art, of art is reveal, of London is revealed in a painting by John O'Connor, um, who exhibited this painting in 1874. It very much reflects the style of Canaletto. Um, he even positioned himself in the same, on the same terrace of Somerset House to echo Canaletto's paintings of the same view some 130 years before. Um, this painting is actually a celebration of the new, newly completed um, embankment. But you can see, again, there, there's evidence of smoky industries um, pushing their smoke up to, to the sky. But this is a very ordered kind of view of London life again. Um, you've got the um, people, uh, the woman in the pram, I can't see it properly from this angle, and of course the soldiers noting that everything is okay um, in England's capital city. And there you see the kind of reassure, reassuring view of St Paul's as well. Um, a building that of course suffered massively from smoke and fog and was pitted with kind of black um, from the atmosphere. Another successful painter of London was David Roberts, who we mentioned before. He undertook a series of views of London in the 1860s, which were actually criticised in Blackwood's magazine for the absence of fog or smoke. The, well, there's more there, I think, but you know. Um, you've got the yellowing clouds there um, and the steamboats there. Um, but again, none of it's really obscured. Black Blackwood's critic um, wondered if the painter had confused the city with Venice. <laughs> While a writer for the Saturday Review lamented that we fail to recognise, whether in figures or shipping, the traffic that's really peculiar to our own river. In point of fact, Mr Roberts has treated us to a foreign importation. But Roberts had a wealthy patron, Charles Lucas, who owned the contracting firm which built the Metropolitan and District Lines. Roberts would not have risked offending such a law patron, patron who bought all of his paintings. But worse was to follow for another English artist, um, William Wiley. Um, 
He aroused fierce criticism for his disagreeable representation of London in his painting, London from the Monument, um, uh, which is 1870. It began well by being honoured with a position on the line um, in the Royal Academy in 1870. It depicts London, as it suggests, from the top of one of its tallest structures at the time. You've got Cannon Street Railway Bridge there in the centre. Again, this very this common theme that the bridge should divide um, the paintings in two. Um, it, divides, um, it divides it into the foreground kind of industrial um, buildings of the south side and the railway shed of the station. Um, beyond the bridge lies London, almost submerged in this kind of yellow fog, um, obviously caused by the numerous smoking chimneys of the houses and factories. London is almost dissolving under a Turneresque yellow vapour, and the Houses of Parliament in the distance have become indistinct shadowy shapes. I think they're there. Um, the painting did not sell well and received damning criticism from the art journal of that year. The city seems a fast pandemonium. The picture is undoubtedly clever and yet disagreeable. Worse was to follow when, according to Mrs. Wiley, a picture dealer known as Little T came into Wiley's bedroom where the painting was hung. He looked at the picture for some time and said, what do you want for it? Bill named his price. T said, I'll tell you what I value it at. He took out his penknife, opened it, reached over and stuck the blade right into the middle of the canvas. There's a critic. Um, <laughs> it was foreign artists who made the difference between seeing the foggy atmosphere of London. It was foreign artists who made the difference between seeing the foggy atmosphere of London as a nuisance and seeing the potential of painting light through the fog and mist within the urban setting. James McNeil Whistler arrived in London in 1859. Um, John House suggests, beginning in the early 1860s, mist and fog became an increasingly central element in Whistler's paintings of the Thames. These paintings were not intended to highlight the atmosphere in problematic terms and relate it to problems of air pollution. So he's not linking the kind of the factories and chimneys, uh, household chimneys, to the actual fog problem. They reflected his wish to aesthetize the visual experience. So here we got Battersea Reach from Lindsay Houses, which is a view actually from Whistler's house in what is now Cheney Walk, Chelsea. And it shows the Thames smothered by fog. This actually took seven years to complete, so it shows the difficulty Whistler had with the concept. Um, a Thames lighter, as indicated by the brown sails, attempts to find its way home. There's a kind of mystique e eastern quality about it. You know, these, uh, the, 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 almost the kimono-like dress, the parasol, parasol etc. Um, as I say, he's not really interested in showing the source of the fog. Uh, in the smoke of the river steamers. For him, it's just a means of capturing the light through the haze. Um, and of course, he would have been aware of the constant steamboat traffic living so close to the Thames that his view would have actually been um, of the Morgan Crucible Company and Price's Candles factories on the other side. The faint mode mound in the top left um, is actually a coal slag heap in Battersea Shore with a church next to it on a far-off island. But it faced the same fate as the others on this subject. It was rejected by the Academy, and as with Turner's earlier work, it was never finished and certainly never sold. But he didn't give up. In 1881, um, he started this view of central London in the fog. It's called Nocturning Grey and Gold Piccadilly. Um, it took only two years to complete, so he was obviously getting a bit faster with them. Um, and I think the contemporary London would have recognised a, a scene all too familiar. It's actually a picture that both evokes mystery and fear, I think. Um, the ba background seems to be a kind of empty chasm. Um, um, I mean, we know there are things there, but they're just looming there, the dark shadows. Um, the street lights and the brighter windows are to give the overall impression of these looming towards the viewer, um, as in fact they often seem to be on a foggy night, which is the link light as the lights would quite, quite often be more of a distraction than a help. The horses and people are ghostly silhouettes whose form appears to be dissolving before our very eyes. The people on the top of the carriages um, uh, in the foreground appear to be floating on air. 
The eeriness and the ghostliness are enhan further enhanced by the flares of the link lighters, which I think you can see in the backgrounds there. Um, it reveals a world um, disappearing into formless formlessness beneath the weight of the yellow-grey fog. The Kensington News actually described this painting as one of the most enchanting little atmospheric gems one could well desire to possess. In spite of this, it failed to find an immediate buyer with a desire to possess it when it was exhibited on Bond Street that May. Wouldn't we quite like the chance to make, a, make an offer for it now? It was actually Whistler's aim, as I've said, to aestheticise London fog. As he said in his famous 10 o'clock lecture, which I've put on there of 1885, and when the evening mist clothes the riverside with poetry, as with a veil, and the poor buildings lose themselves in the dim sky, and the tall chimneys become campanile, and the warehouses are palaces in the night, and the whole city hangs in the heavens, and fairyland is before us, then the wayfarer hastens home. The working man and the cultured one, and I just want to point out the use of the word cultured because it will come up later in Oscar Wilde, and the cultured one, the wise man and the one of pleasure cease to understand as they have ceased to see, and nature, who for once has sung in tune, sings her exquisite song to the artist alone. For the artist, the veil disguises the poverty, commercialism and squalor of London, transforming it into the magical world, wiping out all social and moral distinctions in blinding them to the aesthetic possibilities of a natural phenomenon. Not that it was a natural phenomenon. Whistler does not acknowledge in this passage, at least, that the fog could be partly man-made. He just finds it enchanting. And I think you can see from this punch cartoon over a decade later that people were still failing to see the point of Whistler's style. Um, the winter art exhibitions, no one can see their way. Um, can anyone help me out here? I think you can see. You've probably got a better view of it than I have. Another great painter of London Fog was, of course, one of the leaders of the Impressionist movement in art, and so we move on to Claude Monet. It was his work, Impression, Sunrising, 1872, which led a critic to coin the word for the movement. Monet's growing focus on the effects of atmosphere and light found an ideal subject in the Thames, shrouded in a winter fog, which he initially encountered when he fled to London um, in, from Paris after the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. I'm not going to spend too long on this very early work, but it's painted from the Victorian embankment, looking towards Westminster Bridge and the Houses of Parliament there. You can see that Houses of Parliament are kind of submerged in a haze, but there's still, they're still a very definite building there. The tonal qualities of the blues and yellows suggest the haze that's hanging over London, but it's not really affecting day-to-day -day life. There are still people working there. Um, the choppy river is, uh, we can see that quite clearly. And I point this out because I want to use it as a comparison to later ones. On a later visit, um, in order to study the impact of the changing atmosphere of London, he took a room on the sixth floor of the Savoy Hotel from September to November 1899, returning to the hotel twice more in order to complete his work. During his second stay, he was unable to use the same room, so he actually had to content himself with a room or with a similar view on the fifth floor. From here, he painted a total of, um, from here he painted Charing Cross Bridge um, and Waterloo Bridge, producing a total of 34 and 41 paintings respectively of each bridge. He did do more, he would start them, continue with them, some he would give up. He used a room in St. Thomas's Hospital to paint a series of paintings on, of the Houses of Parliament, of which 19 examples are known to have survived. This series of paintings took about five years um, to complete, showing the complexity of trying to capture his impression of a fleeting moment. So let's start with Waterloo Bridge. And I think one of the things you have to look at is how substantial the bridge is in this one um, and actually see how he dissolves the form in others. So he's playing around with this idea of, of um, dissolution behind, behind the mist and fog. Um, and of course, he had become increasingly interested in multiple versions of the same motif or theme. He wasn't actually interested in landscape, but the sensation produced by the landscape. He wrote that he wished to create a kind of synthesis where I would sum up in one canvas, sometimes two, my impressions and sensations of the past. He wanted these to be kind of exhibited together. 
He was not interested in representing or acknowledging the industrial or political state of the city, except in their atmospheric and material manifestations. Indeed, as one writer suggests, he shows a very series of, a series of very subjective responses to a real place at apparently very particular times. And there are many people who have written about, you know, the, what time of day he painted each painting, etc. But here you can see in the background, you've got the industrial chimneys um, um, producing smoke. You've got these, uh, the semi-elliptical arches of Waterloo Bridge. Um, one, um, and the very choppy um, Thames, which the light has reflected from the bridge of the bridge's structure. Um, a very beautiful picture, I think. Um, here, that's not a very good um, um, print, I don't think, but it's one review commented in June 1904 that it's the action of light on the antique monuments on the bridges of yesterday or today. And Waterloo Bridge was in fact opened by the Prince Regent in 1870, but it had been brought, it had been a bit of a failure and it had been brought in 1878 by the Metropolitan Board of Works when it was open to the public without tolls. And you can see that it's a very busy bridge. Um, it was in fact torn down in 1934 because of the weight of traffic that would cause bottlenecks. Um, um, but it, in 1934, there was a lot of um, reaction against pulling it down, but um, uh, it was deemed, actually the foundations were deemed not to be um, very strong. Um, there are, in this one again, major hints of the traffic, and again, the chimneys behind, um, uh, puffing out the smoke into the air. Um, another one. Here, the bridge is dissolving beneath the weight of the fog. Um, Waterloo Bridge in, in fog here. We're given a view of foggy London, which again is highly coloured. The sky and the river are made up of shades of purple, both reflecting the Thames and the sky reflecting the same colours. On the bridge, again, there's a sense of people, omnibuses, but we can't really see it. We, get a, we can see these boats um, um, on the Thames uh, who continue working. But again, I think very strongly you have a kind of connection between the smoke and chimneys of industry and the fog that is caused by it. Um, here we're actually given, again, the view that Monet would have seen from his hotel on the other side of the river. The Lion Brewery stood with its sculpture of a lion um, on top, and two shot towers can be seen there as well. The scenes are divided horizontally again into by the bridge. Um, this bridge again looks less solid than in the previous two. Um, the flashes of light and the image of dissolution is enhanced by the dark reflections, which are broken up by the choppy waters. Does it inspire a sense of desolation? I think it has been noted that in his later works, uh, after the 1880s, the sociable mo motifs of the 1860s and 70s gradually ebb away, and we more frequently see images of loneliness and of nature and of nature's sublime power. Monet wrote, I adore London. It's a mass, a whole, and it's so simple. But what I love more than anything in London is the fog. Interestingly, without the fog, of course, he could go back to France. Um, <laughs> without the fog, London wouldn't be a beautiful city. It's the fog that gives its magnificent breadth. The city's massive regular blocks, he added, become grandiose within that mysterious cloak. And later he wrote in 1918 to René Pell, London is the more interesting that it is harder to paint. The fog assumes all sorts of colours. There are black, brown, yellow, green, purple fogs. And this is actually true that many scientists noted that there were fogs were made up of these different colours. Of course, they were hints of different colours. Yellow, black, greens, purples, all of which Monet has managed to um, pick out. Um, and he said, the interest in painting is to get objects as seen through all these fogs. My practice eye has found that objects change in appearance in a London fog more and quicker than in any other atmosphere, and the difficulty is to get every change down on canvas. Um, we move on to the series of Charing Cross Bridge, um, um, which, um, again, he did um, quite a few of. It, this was actually a railway bridge um, totally different from Waterloo Bridge. 
Um, it was designed by Sir John Hawkshaw and um, built in 1863, so a later bridge, and again, it carried a lot of traffic um, with its three tracks and um, a footbridge. Um, this is actually a view of an older design because it, was, it actually went um, um, through a major overhaul in 1979. But you can see again, the bridge is actually dissolving beneath the weight of the fog. We have the sun, which is a kind of almost an orange blob, which is causing this kind of um, reflection into the Thames. Um, again, it's, it's very beautiful. Um, there's less industry there, but we can feel that it's there in these background silhouettes. Um, here another one, slightly different again. You can see Westminster Bridge, I think, in the background there. And again, you've got more smoke coming here and you've got the Houses of Parliament beginning to kind of dissolve under the weight of this fog. Um, actually, of course, there is something missing from these paintings, which is Cleopatra's Needle, which actually could be seen from the Savoy. And obviously, Monet made a definite decision to leave it out because he wouldn't have wanted the kind of the vertical thrust um, spoiling the clear line of the bridge from left to right. Um, this is much more highly coloured. The Thames is, um, although we only have a hint of the sun there, um, uh, up there at the top, um, it's colouring the Thames much more. Um, so um, we've got the different kind of yellows, oranges in the river. Another one, smoke in the fog, and again, um, much more you can see the trains producing the, the smoke from the um, uh, trains going over the bridge and pushing up into this rather um, wonderful, magnificent sky, which seems to be so alive. It's got so much energy, so much vitality. You can feel that there's a whole lot going on in that sky, which is reflected underneath in the Thames, the water, which, um, again, there's a lot of kind of movement here. It, I think this one especially brings, brings um, to the fore the relationship between the smoke and the fog. They're separate but related. The smoke pushes a sense of energy into the highly coloured sky and all is reflected in the equally highly coloured river. There's a real sense of movement, I think, in this one. Um, Monet started many sketches at the same time well, we'll move on to the Houses of Parliament in a moment, but the effect that so impressed him, the changing colours of the light and atmosphere, proved an immense problem, as the changes were so rapid that it was difficult to finish any one painting at a time. So he started on several canvases and went back to them when he figured the light was similar. In this way, he started over 100 paintings, many of which he destroyed or never finished. In the end, he gave up and took them all back to his studio in Giverny to complete them. In 19, 1903, he um, wrote to Paul Duran Ruel, his uh, Parisian art dealer, I cannot send you a single painting of the London series, as it is absolutely necessary for the work I'm doing to have them all in front of me. And to be honest, not a single one is completed yet. And I think we have to remember at this time, Monet was immensely wealthy. He'd been hugely successful. So he didn't actually ha have the need to kind of sell a painting a year, um, as many of our previous artists have had to do. Monet did not want each to illustrate a state of the atmosphere individually, standing alone, but he wanted to see them in continuity with each other. His stay in London produced the largest series of paintings that he had yet produced. From this period, he exhibited 37 paintings in 1904 in a, um, a show in Paris, uh, many showing the same London scenes in different atmospheric conditions. Many of the paintings have the word F.A. in the title to indicate the impression of the changing atmosphere on the artist's eye. He once wrote, When I got up, I was terrified to see there was no fog, not even the least trace of mist. I was in despair. It seemed all my canvases were going for naught. But then, little by little, as the fires were lit, the smoke and mist returned. Great. <laughs> um, industrial smoke also enthralled him, and he complained of its atmosphere at absence on Sundays. What a dreary day this damned English Sunday is. Nature feels the effects, and everything is dead. No trains, no smoke, no boats, nothing to inspire me. So here we get, we, 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 this is actually a later um, series, um, which would 
done roughly at the same time of Monet's second or third visit to London, um, which are of the Houses of Parliament, which, as I say, he painted from St. Thomas's Hospital, mainly in the late afternoon and as the sun set. The new Palace of Westminster was built after the old buildings were burned down. Um, I think we all remember that in a picture depicted by Turner. And this designed by Sir Charles Barry, assisted by Bugin in a neo-Gothic style. Its elaborate art architectural ornament ornamentation is not shown in any of Monet's pa paintings. It, he doesn't want to show the detail, as you can see. Um, these were actually seen as the most unified of Monet's series of London paintings. They were actually priced in a higher price bracket than the Charing Cross and the Waterloo Bridge ones. And unlike the bridge ones, they were all of the same size. So he had a much clearer idea with these, what he wanted to achieve and how to achieve it. So here we have variations again on the same theme. We have the um, Houses of Parliament kind of dissolving beneath, again, the weight of the fog. You've got the lights surrounding almost highlighting that the tower there and of course the light reflecting in this, the purple of the river and another one a different again a kind of different variation on the same theme you have this where you've got lots of greens and purples very choppy water and again the light struggling through the clouds um, to kind of give some solidity to the whole picture again there's a kind of eeriness about it a ghostliness um, here, sometimes he put birds in them, not very often, but this is one of the few where you've got seagulls flying in front of, of the Houses of Parliament. And again, using very much these purple hue, um, the Houses of Parliament, again, receding much more, perhaps, than the other two, much less solid, I think, in this one than in the previous ones. Um, this one, Houses of Parliament, London, with the sun breaking through, Again, the Houses of Parliament are again dissolving, but we got much more of the sun. It's a kind of orangey swirl that's breaking through. A, a lovely sense of movement here with the reflection um, on the river. Um, the warm oranges and yellows, I think, kind of make it less isolating, I think. Um, although the bar Parliament buildings are still, their outlines are virtually disappeared in this one. Um, but I do think the sun's reflections, when he shows it, do actually somehow supply hope. Um, um, but perhaps you could say it's also more frightening because it seems to kind of set the buildings alight. I don't know. The yellows speckled with red give them a blood-like luster. The bright colours appear to be held in the air up there, I think. Um, and the water, and in the water, and there... You know, there's a sense of hope, but you could also read it as a sense of menace. Um, so I think, again, that is a rather beautiful one. Monet may have chosen such well-known objects as the Houses of Parliament or the bridges spanning the Thames in order to play with the preconceptions of the viewer and to suggest the transience of apparently fixed impressions dissolving time as well as space. The changing nature of the fog imposed constantly varying um, impressions on the artist and hence the viewer's eye. And Monet returned to France in 1901 and as I say he continued to work on the London series from a photograph. And of course um, we have to let Oscar Wilde have a bit of a say here because in his 1891 essay, The Decay of Lying, and I'm not going to read this all out because you can read it there, but he declares that the fog could only become perceptible when the Impressionists have reinvented it as a thing of beauty, transforming London's prosaic contours into one ones of magic and mystery. And he says, where, if not from the Impressionists, do we get those wonderful brown fogs that come creeping down our streets, blurring the gas lamps and changing the houses into monstrous shadows? Um, things are because we see them, and what we see and how we see it depends on the arts that have influenced us. To look at a thing is very different from seeing a thing. They did... the. Um, there may have been fogs for centuries in London, I dare say they were, but no one saw them and so we do not know anything about them. Well, read my book, Oscar. Um, they did not exist until art had invented them. Now it must ad ad be admitted, fogs are carried to excess. They have become the mere mannerisms of a clique and the exaggerated realism of their method gives dull people bronchitis. 
where the cultured, remember I picked that word out from Whistler's 10 o'clock lecture, and I'm sure he's picking this up quite deliberately, where the cultured catch an effect, the uncultured catch cold. And let's just briefly, because I, I, I've gone on a bit, um, uh, gone longer than my time, but I just want to briefly look at Monet's legacy. Only take a couple of minutes. I won't spend a lot of time on these paintings. André Duran was actually um, um, given a commission by Ambrose Vollard, a dealer, um, with the hope of repeating um, Monet's success. And you can see with these kind of blocks of colours that he uses, um, he's actually doing something very different from Monet. Um, but again, is a kind of view of London um, through a kind of haze, the greeny haze, and there's the, the sun, which is the kind of orange blob in the back. Um, at the same time as Monet was painting, we also had another, um, or just a little after, um, Yoshio Marquina had come over um, at the turn of the century as Monet was painting. Uh, he painted a series of illustrations for the colour of London, and he was from Japan, and he went to San Francisco to paint San Francisco Mist, found it disappointing, and ended up in London for many years before he was deported because of the Second World War, but um, you can see he paints a much prettier uh, view of fog. He's got these two women who are beautifully dressed. He loved doing dresses, um, but again, there's a sense of danger. Are these women about to step out into the road in front of these horses and carriage, just as in our earlier um, um, views. And here is another one from The Colour of London by Yoshio Marcano, a kind of, as you look over the bridge, you look into this kind of foggy well. Um, and actually, it reminds me very much of Bleak House, uh, the opening pages, uh, where people look down into this kind of foggy, uh, this well of fog. So um, another um, inheritor of um, London paintings, uh, 1924, C.R.W. Neverson, the famous war artist. Again, you can see how he's dealing with the smog. He's got this, um, again, the bridge going across with the, the train, uh, the smoke going up into the sky, but it's much more a pinky hue, and much more reassuring, I think. Um, so um, that is just a kind of very quick view of London fog. I could, of course, go on to the 20th century when people like John Virtue, who was the artist in residence at the National Gallery, paints London in very um, black and white colours. And there's no doubt that even though the fog doesn't exist anymore, he's thinking, uh, he's painting London with that historical view. If you want to know more, uh, my book is actually in the bookshop. I, you, forgive me for the plug. Um, but there's lots more in it about legislation, jokes about London fog, believe me, there were many, and uh, punch cartoons. I, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much.